delightful to see so many of you here today for this uh, uh, New America Foundation and Washington Monthly event on college rankings and higher education. I'm Jamie Marisotis. I'm president of Lumina Foundation, and uh, we're pleased to be partners both with the Washington Monthly and with New America uh, in terms of their work in higher education. So, you know, I think, I think, I believe this is my fourth or fifth time uh, kicking off this event. And, you know, one thing I'd like to note here at the outset is how much the conversation about higher education has really changed in this relatively short period of, of time. Higher education is really one of the most important topics of conversation now today here in Washington, in state houses, in corporate boardrooms, in mayor's offices, in community-based organization headquarters, and, in, and at kitchen tables across the nation. And the reason, I think, is that two fundamental things have changed. The first is that the demand for talent is clearly rising in the United States. Coming out of that 2008 recession that impacted so many Americans, we've come to the clear and probably probably irreversible conclusion that some type of post-secondary education, not just four-year degrees, but all of the sub-baccalaureate and indeed all of the non-degree credentials that have been talked about in the last few years are really a prerequisite to success. Some college or some type of post-secondary education that you can get through what we now recognize is a growing number of avenues and channels that extend beyond higher education institutions themselves is no longer nice, it's absolutely necessary. We've long known that individuals are compelled to go to college for two reasons. One is to help you lead a good, ethical, productive, and civically-minded life. And the other is to gain skills and knowledge that will help you succeed in work. Put plainly, all of us who've gotten a good college education can say that their degree helped them accomplish two things, to get a good job and to lead a good life. Now, however, we know better than ever before that these two things aren't just critical to individual success, but to collective well-being. Success in college and having more people with post-secondary skills, knowledge, and abilities leads to a host of outcomes that impact all of us. Lower unemployment, higher wages, more productivity, greater appreciation for diversity, improved uh, civic participation, and a host of, of other benefits. So that demand for talent is growing, and higher education's ability to contribute to meeting that demand, I think, is one of the profound things that we've seen change in the public discourse over the last few years. This, of course, relates to the second reason that things have changed in the last half decade, and that is that higher education's ability to produce that talent in ways that are affordable, accessible, and of sufficient quality to meet those public and private and social and economic outcomes we need is being questioned like never before. The question really isn't, or in my view shouldn't be, is college worth it? Because I think the evidence is overwhelming that absent a higher level of college attainment, our economic and social futures are very much in doubt. Rather, the question being asked or should be asked is how we can build a 21st century higher education system that can literally serve more people better. Higher education's ability to produce those outcomes, or as the monthly's been saying for much of the last decade, what can college do for the country, is the topic of today's event and the spirit of the work that I think New America Foundation and the Washington Monthly have embarked upon since they began their partnership. So today we're gonna hear about the Washington Monthly's influential rankings, which have made I think the student level and civic outcomes of higher education, rather than the reputational factors and input measures, as the entire point of what ranking should be about. We'll also talk about related efforts, like the president's much anticipated, highly um, debated, though at this point still invisible, uh, rating system, and how they might impact our ability to generate more and better graduates from our higher education system. I think there's a lot to cover in that conversation, and as many have observed, the devil really is in the details. But my point here is let's not get caught up in the wonky debates about the differences between ranking and rating or whether we have the perfectly right data to produce these kinds of data-driven metric systems. Instead, let's remember 
uh, that the entire point of these exercises is to ensure that colleges and universities focus on making what students know and are able to do with their college credentials the fundamental core of everything that they do. I'm probably less interested than who's the best or even who's the worst, which is the provocative title of today's event, than I am in ensuring that we focus on developing and deploying much greater capacity to serve those much larger number of Americans who need post-secondary degrees and certificates. Now, we'll also be discussing several other topics near and dear to my heart, the role of federal regulation, a topic that I'm sad to say I was writing about back in the early 1990s and that has clearly gotten worse since I first started writing about it, and how it can be both a boon and a bane to higher education's success. My own view here, and I'll, I'll, um, I'll actually be joining the uh, panel discussion later for some Q&A and might want to expand on this point, uh, is that we've had the wrong conversation about regulation for far too long. What we should be talking about is smart regulation, squarely aimed at unleashing the innovative capacity of higher education to meet that growing demand for talent that I was talking about, especially when it's aimed at serving well the low-income, minority, and other ser underserved populations who should be our top federal policy priority. I'm also very much looking forward to the discussion about improving the largely dysfunctional nexus between the under undergraduate experience and that first rung of the career ladder. It seems to me that this is a conversation we've largely avoided, in part because we aren't really sure what we mean when we want people to be prepared for those good jobs I mentioned earlier. So let me just conclude with uh, some heartfelt thanks uh, to um, and praise, really, for what the Washington Monthly has done since it began uh, its work on college rankings and the production of the College Guide back in 2005. The fact is, the Washington Monthly team have been pioneers in the construction of the annual college rankings. Long before it was in vogue to do so, the Washington Monthly saw a need for an approach to assessing higher education institutions that clearly puts the needs of all students and society at the core. <clears throat> one that avoids the tempting allure of traditional post of of uh, traditional rankings uh, that are that are aimed at at um, sorry that are aimed at uh, making sure that prestige is at the center. Instead, they focus on the more practical assessment of how well institutions fulfill their important mission of serving all types of students well. And, you know, Paul, I'm happy and, and perhaps even a bit amused to see many others jumping on this bandwagon now, including uh, some venerable national publications that we probably won't mention. Indeed, I think it's clear that the inspiration for the president's rating system was probably derived from what the Washington Monthly has done here today. You know, if the country is going to move the needle on increasing attainment, emphasis needs to be placed on the right outcomes, outcomes that reflect student progress that, that ensure that higher education is affordable and that it's producing high quality degrees. The Washington Monthly and New America Foundation deserve our praise and thanks for helping to make this the central focus of the higher education debate today. And I, for one, am very grateful that they've done so. With that, let me introduce the uh, editor in chief of the Washington Monthly, my uh, friend, and uh, some of you who've been to these events before know my former fellow Washington Monthly intern 30 years ago, Paul Glasteris. That's actually right. We, we were both interns at the, at the Washington Monthly, and I think um, it was at that internship that, that Jamie, uh, if, I, if I remember correctly, got an assignment to do something on college access, college financing. And uh, that, was the, that was the right assignment uh, at the right time, uh, surely. Thank you, Jamie. And uh, uh, sometime next year, Jamie's book on, on American talent will be published, and we're all eager for that. And uh, we're just uh, thrilled to have this partnership with Lumina. Um, it's been very important to us. We've been able to uh, really expand our guide and, and infuse it with great journalism, and we're very uh, very pleased uh, to continue and deepen our relationship and partnership with New America. Um, and so uh, 
Jamie did a great job of sort of setting the stage here of what we're going to be talking about. Um, ideas really do matter, and uh, uh, at this uh, event, we're going to try to talk about a couple of uh, a couple of ideas on regulation and on uh, that, as Jamie said, the nexus between college and career. So uh, let me just jump right in and introduce our panel um, uh, today. Uh, the first uh, speaker is going to be uh, Ben Miller. He's a senior policy analyst here at New America uh, and uh, uh, at the education program. He was previously a senior policy advisor in the U.S. Uh, Department of Education, where he also worked on regulatory issues uh, related to the gainful employment rule and has uh, served as a policy analyst in the education sector uh, and has written uh, or been cited in the Washington Monthly and Chronicle of Higher Education and, and other uh, publications. Uh, Zach Schrag uh, is going to be joining us. He's a professor of history at George Mason University and the author of um, Ethical Imperialism, Institutional Review Boards, and the Social Sciences. Um, which uh, is going to be the basis of his talk today and his article in the current issue of the Washington Monthly. Um, he's, uh, his, his articles appeared in uh, the Journal of uh, Political History, uh, the Journal of Urban History, and, and, and other publications, as well as the Washington Post. Uh, Amy Binder is a professor of sociology at the University of California, San Diego, and the, uh, that university is the number one national university in the Washington Monthly uh, uh, rankings this year. Congratulations. Um, there she studies higher education, politics, organizations, and culture. Her most recent book is Becoming Right, How Campuses Shape Young Conservatives. Um, and she received her PhD from Northwestern University, my alma mater, which is number 101 on the Washington Monthly rankings. We've got, some, we've got some work to do. Finally, Kevin Carey, uh, who directs the Educational Policy Program at New America and is a, uh, the longtime guest editor of the Washington Monthly College Guides and uh, our guru on all things higher ed. Um, he has published articles in the New York Times, Slate, The New Republic, American Prospect, Chronicle of Higher Education, and others. Um, his writing has been anthologized in the best American legal writing. Um, and has received two Education, Writer, uh, uh, Education Writers Association awards. And he's got a book coming out uh, next year, The End of College, Creating the Future of Learning and the University of Everything. Um, so panel, come on up and we'll, uh, we'll begin our talk uh, uh, forthwith. Good morning. So when you look at some of the rankings produced by other publications who I'm not going to name here, there's a little bit of a secret they're not telling you. And that's really that when you're looking at those top elite colleges, you're really looking at a series of distinctions without differences. Yes, there are some sort of research universities, there are some liberal arts colleges, there are some on the West Coast, there are some in the Northeast. But really, regardless of which ones you're picking there, you're almost certainly guaranteed to be choosing a place where you know you have extremely high odds of graduating and you're going to have a degree that has a lot of national recognition. But you know, if you look further down those lists and start flipping past the point where they even have numbers attached to the rankings, that's not necessarily the case. And so for a lot of students there, they very, may very well be faced with a set of options where one school is actually going to serve them pretty well and the other is a lurking danger, where they're likely to take on a lot of debt for college and much less likely to finish. And so we set out to try to sort of acknowledge who some of those colleges might be, uh, particularly at the four-year level where the data are a little bit better. And as we started going through this, one of the things we saw was that this is actually a much different exercise from just sort of taking the list of best colleges and just changing the direction in which it's sorted. And that's because the best colleges tend to be sort of the best at everything with the noted exception of socioeconomic and racial diversity. And that's because they all, when you're sitting on billions of dollars in an endowment and taking you know, one out of every 10 students, it's pretty easy to achieve things like a low student to faculty ratio, low class size, a lot of research dollars, and the other things that other rankings not done by the Washington Monthly tend to get rewarded for. Whereas when you talk about colleges that are really struggling and not doing as good of a job, there are a number of different factors and they don't all look the same. 
And in particular, I think there's sort of a judgment call that you have to start thinking about and making between sort of the connection between cost and student debt and completion. In other words, sort of as you think about a school, what is more troubling? A place where someone might be paying $30,000 a year out of pocket and have a completion rate, say, in the low 30s, or a place that's a third of that pri price but has a completion rate, say, in the low 20s. And so what we set out to do was sort of create a number of different lists to sort of explore some of these questions and choices, which I think are also very instructive as you think about some of the same trade-offs and decisions that are going to have to be made by the Obama administration as part of its ranking, or I'm sorry, ratings work. Um, so, you know, the first thing we started with was just asking the question of, if you were to think about sort of what's the most concerning college, what would the factors it have be? And we really boiled this down to four things. So one is sort of the cost that families have to pay out of pocket, which is known as the net price. The next is the graduation rate uh, for bachelor's programs. We only looked at four-year institutions, and we used uh, only federal data. Um, the other is the rate at which students default on their student loans. And then the fourth was the, tip, the median amount of borrowing that someone who takes out loans ends up with. And when you weight all these things equally, you get a list of colleges that's entirely made up of private institutions. And it's about 50-50 between private nonprofits and private for-profits. Um, on the for-profit side, you know, there are branches of colleges you've probably heard of, including a number from the Art Institutes, which is owned by the Education Management Corporation. And then there's largely a number of nonprofits you sort of haven't heard as much of, including a couple art, art institutes, which are different from the Art Institutes. Um, but as we looked at this list, it sort of raised some questions. You know, are debt and cost really as important as completion? Because we know that sort of earning a college degree really has so many positive benefits in terms of lower unemployment, um, greater earnings, and even things in terms of greater likelihood to not default on your student loans. So we tweaked the list a bit and to sort of ask, OK, well, let's put a greater emphasis on completion and include some other metrics like retention rates so that you get credit if you're able to sort of keep those students from your first year to your second year. And when we did this, the list actually looked very different. Because again, sort of the value choices we made started to change who showed up here. And so the second list looked a lot more uh, heavy with for-profit colleges. But interestingly, sort of different ones from the first one. There were only sort of four schools that were on both lists. But this raised another of other questions, because one of the common critiques you'll hear whenever you start talking about federal graduation rates is that it's not capturing all of the students in the measure because the one the federal government uses only includes what's called first-time, full-time students. So someone who is attending college full-time and is not transferring from elsewhere. And as we looked at the data, we saw there were some schools in there where only, say, about 10% of their students actually fit that measure. So we created a third list that tried to acknowledge that by subbing out the typical graduation rate for an alternative one that really looks at sort of of the number of students you have, how many are getting degrees in a given year. So it's a little bit more of a measure of institutional productivity. The other thing we realized is there were some schools on the list, such as one in, I believe, Oklahoma and another in Illinois, that had almost identical borrowing amounts. But at one school, about 70% borrowed, and at the other, about 90% borrowed. And really, that's not necessarily the same school because you're asking about 20% of the student body to take on loans, more of the student body to take on loans at one place rather than the other. So the other thing we did was we adjusted all the debt statistics to acknowledge that actually the rate at which people borrow matters as well as just how much they take out. And when we did this, I think <clears throat> the results of this list really showed sort of one of the thorniest issues that I think has to be addressed as you think about a rating system. And the reason for that is the list that we produced was actually the only one that, only ha that had public institutions on it. There were a couple. And a large number of institutions on here were minority serving institutions. And this really raised the other question, which is sort of, how do we think about the demographic makeup of a college when we're considering its results? You know, I think it would be foolish to claim that demographics have absolutely no effect on results. It's pretty clear that they do matter. But at the same time, we see a number of institutions that do a very good job enrolling low-income and minority students and achieve perfectly fine, if not exceptional, results. And so to sort of do a final list, what we did was we actually tried to include a measure that would give colleges credit depending on if they, how they did on their expected versus their actual graduation rate. And this is a measure we actually pulled from the rest of the Washington Monthly rankings. And in addition, we decided that 
to really hammer home that point, we would give colleges credit for enrolling large numbers of low-income students and enrolling large numbers of black and Hispanic students. But at the same time, we didn't think it was fair to just sort of say, oh, if you just have a lower income population, you just get credit. So we also included measures of the net price charged to the lowest income students and the graduation rate for uh, minority students. Basically saying, we're going to give you credit for it, but as part of that, we really do have an expectation that you will serve them well and not just take them in the door. Because higher education access really has to be more about just sort of, are you providing a spot, but are you also serving them well? And you know, here I think what we saw was a list that was, again, more similar to the first two in that it was all private colleges, only this one was actually more weighted toward private nonprofit institutions, um, particularly some a little bit more in the Northeast, which I think is reflecting a little bit of their diversity being behind sort of other institutions in other parts of the country. And so sort of that's where we ended up, but I think you know, it really showed that kind of the choices you make and the value choices in particular on the sort of cost, debt, and completion spectrum really have a large effect on sort of what you view as worst. And it also showed that you know, there are places where the data are, are reasonably good and useful in terms of sort of the student financial aid side, but there are also some holes in the data that have to be thought about in terms of completion rates. And then the other sort of big lingering piece that we really couldn't answer and would have loved to is sort of the learning side because there's just not any sort of national set of data we could have incorporated there. So I'll stop there and look forward to the Q&A. Uh, thank you. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about the research mission of the university um, rather than the teaching mission primarily. And uh, to do so, I think I need to set forth a couple premises, three actually. Uh, first is that universities should do research. Uh, this is not set in stone. There are certainly colleges that primarily teach and don't produce a lot of research. And there are great research institutions like the Institute for Advanced Studies that don't take students, particularly not undergraduates. But I would say that we've had a track record of about 150 years of the research university, and it's produced some pretty great things, uh, creating knowledge as well as disseminating it. And, uh, also, there's a long tradition within the research university of training the next generation of researchers, whether they remain in the university or go on to careers outside of the university, who will produce knowledge that our society needs. So I think research is a good thing. Uh, the second point I would make is that if we're going to have a research mission, we should do it as efficiently as possible. Research does consume resources, taxpayer dollars, foundation dollars, and perhaps most significantly for our discussion today, student dollars as well as the scarce time that faculty and students have to devote to their work. So we don't want unnecessary obstacles to research. And th my final premise is that research is actually not an unusual activity, but a fundamental human experience. Uh, if you have children, you know that by two months or so, they are observing other people and looking around the world. And by two years, they are asking questions. And since my kids are only seven and eight, um, eight and nine now, I, I don't actually know when that phase stops. They're still <laughs> asking questions constantly. Um, and one of the functions of the university is to tell people that it's OK to keep asking questions as adults and to extend that sense of childhood wonder uh, throughout life. Um, and these aren't terribly controversial ideas. Most people in the university would agree. So it would take a pretty powerful force to persuade university faculty and university administrators to constrict research and tell people not to ask questions. But there is such a force, and it's called ethics. Uh, in the name of ethics, this wonderful thing, strange things happen. Uh, we have these university bodies called institutional review boards, or IRBs, that assert the right to tell researchers what questions they can ask and what questions they cannot ask. And they take these leading researchers in the field, the top people from around the world, and make them take these online training tests with insipid multiple choice answers that are often completely irrelevant to the projects that they are planning. They demand reports with useless information. And if a researcher resists, the boards, or in many cases the office staff that serves the boards, threaten them with firing, or what in many cases is more alarming, the denial of a degree. So you have graduate students working for years on a dissertation being told, you will not get your doctorate if you don't follow these rules. So they have a lot of power. In my article for the magazine, I tell the story of one such researcher, Kimberly Sue, who was simultaneously pursuing a medical degree and a PhD in anthropology at Harvard. So she had some things going for her. 
Um, her project was to understand what happens to women who are addicted to opiates, heroin and other opiates, uh, many of whom are terribly served by the combination of the criminal justice system and the social service system. So they come into jail, there's a little bit of heroin, but usually they go cold turkey by necessity, and they're kicked out onto the street, no program to help them back in the same environment where they were using drugs, and they have a lot of trouble uh, staying clean, and they're not getting good help. And Sue's project, talking to these women, honestly, I think is university research at its best. Uh, you're serving the immediate community, you're serving the long-term needs of the country in terms of policy, and at the same time, you're taking this young researcher and who has plans to go on to be a clinician and a teacher, and you're giving her the skills under expert supervision to continue to do that research. But Dr. Sue, because uh, she has her uh, PhD now, uh, told me just a terrible story about her encounter with this ethics board, and I've heard some pretty bad ones. Uh, it took her about half a year to get initial approval to talk to the women whom she'd already known from various contexts. Uh, the IRB staff offered one objection after another. They said, you can't talk to children or if there are children nearby. You can't talk to people who have mental illness. You have to get signatures on these long consent forms that no one actually understands. Uh, once you have data, you have to keep it in a locker that not even janitors have access to. The same thing as if it were bioterrorism research. And Sue was able to eventually negotiate an agreement, um, but in part, you know, this was by compromising things that she really wanted to do. And as a result, her research is less bold and less rich than she would have liked. All of this was done with good intentions. Uh, she had taken a medical school ethics class. She had read about some of the horrible medical experiments that were done on prisoners in the 1950s and 60s. And when I talked to her, she said, look, I would love to have an ethics review process that worked, that actually is relevant to the challenges that I face. But instead, she felt that she was facing a bureaucracy whose main goal seemed to avoiding short-term risks to sue to her informants and to the university, no matter the long-term consequences to each of them and to human knowledge. This is a particularly dramatic case, but it's not a unique one. Uh, we've had IRBs since the mid-1960s, and from the beginning, anthropologists, political scientists, social, uh, sociologists, later historians, have been complaining that it's silly to take a review process designed for medical experimentation and impose it on all kinds of information gathering, including ethnography and other qualitative research. And for, since at least the 1970s, uh, it's proven that their complaints were quite right. Uh, we have researchers, such as Professor Binder here, who are forced to limit some of the dissemination of their results, and she was forced to uh, disguise some of the information in her very fine book. Uh, something similar happened to a geographer I talked to, Joshua Inwood, who was talking to public officials about their political positions, and the IRB said, well, if you reveal that information, they might not win re-election, and that would be a harm to human subjects. Uh, Joshua Inwood has another name for it. He calls it democracy. Um, <laughs> So you have people who are banned from researching in certain places, talking to certain people, asking certain questions, and then there are folks like me. I don't have a terribly bad IRB story. I just had to waste a lot of my time on these multiple choice tests and this paperwork, and it got me annoyed enough. Um, but for a lot of people, that inhibits research. We have uh, historians, for example, who won't let undergraduates interview their grandmothers because it would just be too much of a hassle to get all the necessary approvals. So. Uh, Many of the researchers I've talked to, and this was my own experience, uh, go into the process thinking that it's going to work. They, they say, ethics, what could be wrong with that? Um, and when things start to go bad, when they get these unreasonable requests, they think, I must be doing something wrong. It must be me. Um, and they start to ask questions. They ask questions of the administrator, of the IRB chair, of the vice provost for research, whatever it is. Um, and they're constantly told, no, the system is working. You're the problem. And it's true that for a lot of IRB uh, a lot of IRBs out there, for, for certain kinds of research, it's not a problem. If you're doing a psychological experiment trying to find how people respond to alarm bells of different tones, and you're doing 27 different varieties of the experiment, getting approval for the 26th is probably pretty easy. You get through one proposal and then you modify it. So quali quantitative researchers, uh, psychologists, and even medical researchers don't have too much trouble. But when you try to do something qualitative, when you try to do something innovative, um, some of the most important research that we need, the IRB can be a significant obstacle. Uh, typically, qualitative researchers do not have a lot of clout in the university. 
We don't bring in big research grants. We don't employ armies of postdocs. But we are better than average storytellers. And so we have a steady stream of narratives explaining the problems we faced with these well-intentioned but misguided ethics boards. Uh, I have a blog that's been going on since late 2006 that collects these stories. And in part, I'm just trying to remind individual researchers, no, it's not you. Uh, it's the system that is causing the problem. And I hope that this may bring some systemic change. Uh, we've seen this in Canada already, where they had a terrible set of regulations, not guidelines technically, uh, going in 1998. Uh, social scientists from around the country complained, and those guidelines were significantly revised in 2010 and made much more adaptive to the different kinds of research that goes on in the university. It's still a little too early to tell how those are going and in practice. It's very hard to change a culture, but um, it shows what is possible. And here in the United States, three years ago, the federal government, quite to my surprise, conceded that over-regulating social and behavioral research in general may serve to distract attention from attempts to identify those social and behavioral research studies that do pose threats to the welfare of subjects and thus merit significant oversight. So this was an abrupt change, an admission that the system is not working, that is putting harmless research through a lot of trouble and taking attention away from the relatively small numbers of social science projects that could cause real ethical concerns. So that was very exciting. It's been three years. We're still waiting for a proposed rule. So I'm not too sure whether those regulations will change. Uh, until they do, we need to rely on researchers to avoid self-censorship. We need them to push against inappropriate restrictions and as best they can to tell their stories. And most of all, we need them to keep asking questions. Thanks. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I'm tempted to throw my notes overboard and just tell you horror stories about IRB, but I won't do that. Um, I found it a little awkward to be on this panel because its uh, title is Worst Colleges, and I'll be talking about the sector of higher education, which has traditionally been recognized as the highest quality. So those universities, Harvard and Stanford, in my current research, uh, that would vie for the number one slot on, say, US News and World Report rankings. Um, that said, there are dysfunctionalities at these universities, in particular as they pertain to uh, students' searches uh, on the job market. So I'm going to start with a couple of observations about these universities in relation to the labor force based on research that I and a graduate student at UC San Diego, uh, whose name is Dan Davis, are conducting currently. And the first is that there have always been occupations that have served as pipelines or as feeder schools uh, um, uh, to uh, particular uh, occupations. I'm sorry, there are universities that serve as pipelines or feeder schools to particular occupations. So in the 1950s and 60s, the CIA, the State Department, recruited heavily on campuses like Harvard, Princeton, Yale. Uh, in the 1970s and 80s, law and medicine via professional schools uh, hoovered up large numbers of students, uh, continue to do so, but since the 1980s, uh, for, for historical reasons that I won't get into uh, right now, finance and consulting firms, so Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, uh, McKinsey, Bain, and so forth, have hired an extraordinary share of students from our most elite universities. So in 2007, 47%, nearly half of all graduating seniors from Harvard and peer institutions accepted two-year analyst positions in these two industries. Uh, of course, then there was an economic meltdown. We had the worst uh, recession in American history since the Great Depression. And these sectors, along with other sectors in the economy, contracted. These contractions led to less hiring uh, from these uh, universities. Uh, but even then, they only went down to about 20% of the graduating seniors. And since uh, 2008, 2009, these numbers have been climbing again, such that in 2014, 31%, uh, almost a third of graduating seniors from Harvard went into finance and consulting. So together, these two industries uh, are far outpacing all other sectors. Now, how does this happen? Uh, most explanations, and here I get my little dig into the economist back, uh, so most explanations by which I mean 
uh, economist explanations uh, would give, uh, not explanations by sociologists, uh, economists would argue a basic supply and demand uh, kind of relationship between well-paying jobs on the one hand and um, uh, students who are eager to take these jobs. Uh, after all, entry-level jobs in finance and consulting firms pay starting salaries of eighty to $100,000 a year these days, and that's before bonuses and so forth. But what we found in our research uh, is that this economic explanation is partial at best. It doesn't capture what's really happening on these campuses um, uh, in terms of the links between these two schools. Uh, for one, most of the students that we talked with uh, are taking these jobs but are not eager to do so, as we usually think of the, of the word eager. They talk about falling into these jobs for a bunch of uh, other reasons besides being inherently swept up by their passion for working on derivatives, uh, working on mergers and acquisitions, restructuring, downsizing, et cetera. Uh, these are not generally people who uh, have dreamed all their lives of being Gordon Gecko or Masters of the Universe or a Wolf of Wall Street and so forth. Um, and in fact, when they walk onto campus, they have never heard of these professions by and large. Uh, the vast majority had not heard of these professions. Now, it's definitely true that Ivy League uh, students are vocationally minded and they're thinking about their future job opportunities a lot. Uh, but they talk about wanting to have jobs that are personally rewarding. They want to have jobs that make an impact on society. Uh, they want jobs that will signal their talents and excellence to their peers and to others in their universities. And they see this as the rightful province of having attended Harvard and Stanford in the first place. They want to be leaders in society. And what's really fascinating is that students who end up falling into finance and consulting jobs uh, can figure out ways to think about those jobs as making an impact and being personally rewarding. But even they realize that it takes a lot of contorted logic to do so. Um, and they mostly told us that they take these jobs because they're the ones that are most readily available on campus. They take them because these are the jobs that so many of their classmates are also chasing after, which by definition must mean that they're good jobs, prestigious jobs. Um, they're taking them while they're trying to figure out what their passions are, what they truly want to do. Uh, and they also take them because they see them as career accelerators, that they will open doors uh, later on for them. So it's not that students are eager to take the jobs uh, in, the, in the way that we usually think about it. Um, they're really falling into them. Now, a second reason a strict economistic version is incomplete is that this explanation completely misses the middleman. Um, uh, so, so if we have the kind of economist view of supply over here and demand over here, it's not, th that kind of explanation is not seeing this incredibly important intermediary, which is the universities uh, where recruitment is happening. Um, these kinds of job choices are not happening in, in an organizational vacuum. These students are not finding these jobs on the internet. They're not searching monster.com for them. They're not even using personal connections to get these jobs. Um, they're getting them through universities, and universities are uh, involved in a very concerted effort to link the jobs with the students. And career services centers at Harvard, at Stanford, at Princeton, at Yale, and so forth, make it extraordinarily easy for employers to find students and for the students to find these employers in these sectors. And when I say easy, I don't mean cheap. Um, these firms pay hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars per year to run uh, what's known as structured recruitment on campus. And structured recruitment uh, is a system by which schools charge um, uh, very large fees for nearly unlimited access to students. So in exchange for payment, career service centers uh, hand out the best tables at campus career fairs. But that's, that's just the beginning, folks. Um, they facilitate access to students' inboxes. Students are absolutely inundated with emails uh, their fall and um, fall semester and fall quarters. Um, the Career Services Center schedule networking and uh, information sessions 
options for the firms where alums from the very schools where they're coming back to recruit these students talk about their transition from, say, Harvard or Stanford to these fantastic jobs at Goldman Sachs. Uh, the Career Services Centers schedule opulent receptions, help the firms schedule these receptions. And in an additional move, a very important one, the universities collect students' resumes and bundle them together for delivery directly to the finance and consulting sectors, uh, each firm at a time. And another scholar, Lauren Rivera, who's an assistant professor at the Kellogg School at Northwestern University, ranked 101 on the Washington Monthly List, um, she estimates that 70% of Harvard students enter into this structured recruitment uh, system. This is a massive organizational production. So it'd be a real mistake to think of universities like Harvard and Stanford uh, as innocent bystanders which are passively looking on as investment banks come and recruit their students. Um, rather, they're the facilitators of these linkages. Uh, they're being paid to facilitate these linkages. And they are these facilitators because it's of great interest to them to do that. I mean, they have interests um, uh, uh, of many different sorts uh, in putting kids on a conveyor belt to these professions. And some of them that are worth mentioning is uh, they want to make sure that their students are gainfully employed. Uh, indeed, they want to make sure that their students are gainfully employed in high, uh, with high salaries because, uh, as you might recall from the US News and World Report rankings, uh, this is one of the criteria that adds up into uh, what, what makes a, a school uh, one of the best. Uh, they're also interested in making sure that their students are building high-powered networks as they're leaving school. Uh, they are also satisfying alums of their own uh, who already work in these industries. And they're creating another generation of deep-pocketed uh, alumni. Uh, many of these folks will not stay in these uh, analyst positions, but they'll move on uh, to other kind of high-powered positions from the kinds of networks that they've made uh, in these sectors. Uh, and at a more immediate level, uh, the schools are making a lot of money through this recruitment. So as a result, what Dan Davis and I see happening in terms of the number of students taking Wall Street jobs has much more to do with how career prestige uh, and status come to be constructed on campus, um, and that this occurs as a direct result of the kind of organizational apparatus that is on campus uh, leading uh, students to these jobs and providing this organizational structure uh, that actually delivers students into these jobs and by bolstering all of this prestige talk that happens on campus, um, they're really narrowing the job options that uh, these students have. I have uh, just a couple more comments uh, about what might change on campus. Um, and as an academic, I normally don't get to uh, do this, it's talk about policy implications, because it's not part of the research uh, profile as much. But having worked with the Washington Monthly, I was pushed to do so. So I'm very happy to share just a couple of ideas. Um, if we want to change things on campus, uh, this sounds perhaps like a cynical move, but I think that what we would have to do is get universities to subsidize, uh, in part, other industries to come on campus and to create the kinds of high stakes tournament system uh, that currently exists for finance and consulting. And it's very interesting to look at Teach for America. I don't know what people think about Teach for America in the room. There are uh, benefits, there are drawbacks. But they did, uh, Wendy Kopp, the founder of Teach for America, absolutely did understand that competitive um, structures of, of the sort that exist for finance and consulting can actually lure uh, students into po poverty schools, right? Uh, so the students aren't necessarily chasing salaries in finance and consulting. They're chasing that competitive um, tournament uh, that proves that they are the best of the best. And Teach for America was, was able to mobilize uh, the same kind of uh, ideas on campus. And other sectors from the federal government to NGOs, biotech industry, energy industries, uh, might also think about creating such structures on campus. Thank you.
Um, I'd like to start just by um, tying some of the themes we've just heard about together, uh, if I might. I think um, you know one of the things that Ben talked about um, was that in exploring this idea of America's worst colleges, uh, we don't. There are certain kinds of important information that we don't didn't have available to us to work with, and one of them was information about student learning. Um, and you know, I've, I've always throughout my career, when this sort of subject of how much do students learn while they're in college come up and I talk to people, academics in the field, I'll say something like, well, you know, why can't you find out? Because after all, you work on a university full of students. They're right there. They're all around you. So it's not as if you don't know who to go to or who to look at in trying to figure out um, how much they're learning. But sometimes the answer is, aha, but if you talk about them that way, they're human subjects. And if they're human subjects, and I'm going to have to go through the whole IRB process, and no way am I doing that. It would be crazy. And I mean, it's not, not only actually just having to go through the IRB process. I mean, uh, researchers on their own campuses you know, routinely can't get information from registrars. Um, they, can't, they would have to go to and get permission from individual departments, which are, or from the dean of students, all of whom are presumed to have different levels of control and different interests. And so. Um, uh, the IRB process, I think, is, is an important part of a larger set of arrangements in which um, universities have made their own students invisible to themselves and into any of their own um, possible efforts to find out um, how much their students are learning. And that presumes they even want to know. Um, so I think that's one, one of the things that we're going to have to work through as we, as we continue to build that important piece of information. Um, another you know, big uh, uh, element of this question of college quality is what happens to students in the labor market. And that's another area where we don't currently have um, enough national data to really include that in a, a worst colleges list. Um, and you know, by and large, I think there's a desire among policymakers and parents that there should be a um, functional relationship between higher education and the workforce. Uh, that well, when you ask parents and students, why are you going to college, the answer they overwhelmingly give is to get a better job or to get a job. That's why they're going. Um, and it's what they're paying for. And uh, because you have to work to live in the United States of America, and increasingly you, you have to borrow to be educated, um, people have to be able to get jobs in order to, to pay their loans back. And um, as we see, did the new loan data come out yesterday? Is it worse? It is not public yet, uh, for unknown reasons. For unknown reasons. Okay. <laughs> well, let's just say that the data that everyone thought was coming out yesterday show um, <laughs> that uh, uh, many and a growing number of students can, are having trouble repaying their loans. Um, we have to be concerned about whether can, students can get jobs, because the only way you pay your loan back is to get a job and earn a wage. Um, it is interesting, however, to sort of see how that mindset um, could be taken to an extreme. And you know, that's what I was really reminded of in reading Amy's article, where you know, certainly one couldn't complain that Harvard and Stanford are not creating a system in which there's a connection between uh, their students and the workforce. Um, the connection seems to have been um, made to a fault. Um, and it sort of shows how um, you know, the, the logic of the marketplace and the uh, actions of people making rational choices, either at the institutional level, at the student level, or at the labor market level about maximizing value and money um, can start to sort of overwhelm the non-market mission of uh, higher education, the good life um, uh, that Jamie mentioned, um, as well as the good job. And so it's, I think, something for us to be mindful of as we try to kind of build those connections and try to create incentives for institutions um, to help their students get jobs via uh, introducing labor market data into our notions of quality. Um, and you know, more broadly, I think it's been interesting. Um, one thing I think we've learned over the last few weeks is that if you want to get a lengthy and very well written email from a college president explaining why you don't know what you're talking about, um, <laughs> locate his or her college somewhere near the phrase <laughs> worst colleges. <laughs> and, um, and, and I, you know, I mean, it's, it's very clear to us that the, just the phrase worst colleges is um, considered to be impolite, if not inappropriate, to even use in the context of higher education, um, which of course is one of the reasons that, that we used it. Um, <laughs> is, um, you know, I think that it is the logical corollary of the idea of best colleges, and that's an idea that colleges are um, 
you know, more than willing to embrace. But, you know, more broadly, uh, and just to kind of emphasize something Ben said at the very beginning, um, we feel the stakes are much higher for understanding who America's worst colleges are. Um, if you are uh, lucky and privileged enough to make a choice among the institutions that are commonly thought to be America's best colleges, it, there really is no cho bad choice to make. You are just sort of blessed with a bunch of good choices. You could uh, roll the dice and, and you would be fine. Whereas, um, if you are, as, and this is of course the case for the vast majority of American college students, not in a position to choose among many, many elite institutions, but rather um, making a series of somewhat more prosaic choices among um, different kinds of colleges that are uh, relatively open admission, that are not particularly famous. Um, it's actually a much, much riskier proposition than I think parents realize. Um, you know, one of the articles in the issue, um, it was kind of to go along with Ben's sort of broader analysis of um, this idea of worst colleges, focused on one of the colleges that shows up in the list. It was a, a small liberal arts college here in Virginia called Ferrum College. Um, which was interesting, um, first of all, because until the list came out, I had never heard of it before. It's not that far from Washington. Um, and, you know, like we do this for a living. We sort of are always kind of looking at long lists of colleges. Had never heard of Ferrum College before. And we sent a reporter out there to spend some time talking to people and asking them questions like, why is it that half of your freshmen don't return for their sophomore year? And again, this is not a, an institution built uh, to educate. Uh, transient or part-time students. Overwhelmingly, the students who were enrolling were 18 years old and coming full-time right out of high school. Half of them weren't coming back um, for their sophomore year. Um, graduation rates were low. Loan default rates were high. Um, uh, uh, the, w it wasn't particularly inexpensive. And the thing is, you know, what you realize is that there's absolutely no um, awareness in the market that this is true. Um, to the extent that you can make a plausible case, and I think this case can be made, that even in the context of um, liberal arts colleges in the mid-Atlantic region with low admission standards, this college is doing substantially worse than its peers. Nobody knows that. The students don't know it. Um, it's not in any way influencing that fact, which I think is a fact, is not in any way influencing the choices that parents and students are making um, about where to go to college. They just don't know. The college kind of knows if you press them on it, but you know they have a series of explanations which are kind of plausible, kind of not. It's a complicated thing to figure out. Um, and and it, I just don't think that we can rely on um, the market by itself for parents and students to make a very, very difficult set of choices um, with information that is either hard to get, um, uh, unavailable, uh, hard to interpret, hard to synthesize. And that, I think, is really what has led to um, that fact is, I think, one of the main reasons that, that has led to the um, still notional um, federal college uh, rating system that the Obama administration um, has proposed. And you know, although I don't know this for a fact, I suspect it's because um, somewhere in the White House or the Department of Education, they're sitting here with a, a bunch of lists that look kind of like the list that Ben put together and said, gosh, this is this is pretty complicated once you sort of get down to it and you're not doing the easy thing, which is to just identify the institution that have all the money and all the smart people in them. Um, but I do think it is a very necessary thing to do. I think it's, I'm glad that the administration has taken on this difficult challenge that's probably going to win them more enemies than friends. Um, but when you kind of look at these numbers and you realize the stakes involved, um, for, and you realize the, the students and how vulnerable they are, I think it's something that has to be done. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, a, a round of applause for a ter tremendous uh, <laughs> series of presentations. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to ask a, a few questions before uh, opening uh, opening up to the audience. Just to to because I actually edited uh, these pieces, I know there's some interesting um, points that can be made, and and so let me let me. Uh, Make one point, which is that that we have a pro we've we've identified problems at the upper end of the college system and at the lower end of the college system. Yeah. Um, uh, at the, at the lower end, um, uh, while we have these problems that have been identified, I think it's worth pointing out that that this is also the America's gold mine. Um, the economy needs uh, uh, several million more college four-year degrees, two-year degrees, technical training than the system is now producing. 
um, and uh, at the uh, as the the president of uh, of of uh, Arizona State University likes to say the, the you know the upper fifty percent of the income bracket that market of college graduates is saturated. Everybody who can go to college is going to college for the most part. It is in the bottom fifty percent where the the, the su potential supply of college grads can be found to fill the needs of a of a of a, of a growing economy and to make us all more prosperous. Um, those folks are by and large for reasons of geography and finance and culture being channeled into the worst colleges, right? These are kids who made it through the worst high schools for the most part. So they're the scrappy, you know, hard charging people that we should most be, uh, our hearts should be with them the most. And having achieved this sort of against the, uh, against the current uh, uh, goal of getting out of high school, we then put them into colleges where their chances are are much less of success than somebody from a middle or upper middle class background. So, so not only is it sort of horrible when you think about it from a moral point of view, but it's 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 wasting the greatest asset the country has in terms of, fi of filling the 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 supply that we need of of uh, people with uh, post secondary degrees. Um, uh, let me just ask uh, Amy Binder a, a, a question. Amy, why is it structurally or economically that, that, that Wall Street and the consulting industry is so motivated to go and essentially rig the game at Harvard and Stanford and so forth to get these young undergraduates and other industries that have, e it would seem to me, equal need for smart you know, new employees, the, you know, the energy sector that's figuring out how to drill down 20,000 feet or the, as you mentioned, the biotech industry that's, you know, sequencing the genome and so forth. <laughs> why, why aren't they doing the same recruiting? You think those needs are as great as figuring out derivatives, Paul? Well, <laughs> almost as great. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, so I, I have relied on other people's research uh, to figure out the answer to this. Uh, I have not done the archival, the hard archi archival research on this yet. But as far as uh, what I can tell in the research is that in the 1980s, uh, when this structured recruitment began, uh, Wall Street was flush with money. And what they wanted to do was bring in uh, folks who could signal to their clients um, that these are the best brains in the world and that even our lowest employee um, can help you do these very difficult things that you need to do. So I think it's very much a kind of symbolic ceremonial um, effort on, on their part. Interesting. Um, ben, we, we, uh, Kevin talked a little bit about, about Ferrum, uh, this college in, in, in Virginia that um, by all you know, by in every way we looked at it, it looked like a per, kind of a normal um, liberal arts college. Um, what is the difference between s some of these colleges like Ferrum that seem to want to do right and some other colleges on your list that um, maybe are a little bit more openly predatory? Sure, I mean, I think one of the things that struck me in looking at this list is that you didn't see sort of any necessarily common indicator across all of them. So you did see some of these uh, smaller liberal arts colleges where their challenges are probably somewhat a reflection of the fact that they don't have a ton of money and so they're charging people probably too much given what they're offering, but that's sort of where they're coming from. And then you see some others that, you're, they're not only on these lists, but if you go into Google Finance and pull up their stock, symbol, they're also showing up there as well. And I think that you have to wonder a little bit about some of them, uh, in particular the EDMC schools, which um, sort of back in the day weren't, weren't too bad, but sort of I think over time as the influence of the pressures from Wall Street has probably changed their mission somewhat and rebalanced kind of that need to fundamentally serve students at the end of the day with also the need to fundamentally meet sort of quarterly enrollment targets and quarterly profit targets that's going to change their mission and affect things like how much they're charging for people 
or how much they have to rely on loan debt to make their revenue streams work and things like that. And so I think there is a real difference you see in this list between the nonprofits who they have a challenging set of circumstances but are ultimately sort of trying to educate people and the for-profits that have that mindset as well but then also an additional set of external pressures that can change the way they have to operate. Zach, I just want um, you to tell the audience the, the one little fact that really jumped out, one of the many facts that jumped out at me from your terrific piece was college librarians. Yes. Uh, yeah, so this is actually an interesting uh, case. One of the colleges that was mentioned as doing quite well is Baruch College, uh, where I taught for a year, and it's a great place. But uh, this goes to this question about studying your own students, where a librarian wanted to know how the students were using the library. And it took her five months to get the approval. And I asked her, we corresponded by email, like, what were they worried about? Well, you know, what if the students are dealing drugs in the library and they'll tell you that and they'll get arrested? And, and I asked her, well, why would they tell you that? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, you're asking, like, do they use the card catalog or do they go online? Um, uh, so, uh, and the, the, the sad thing there in my correspondence with this librarian, she had written this article in a kind of happy tone, like, it only took me five months. And, and I had to say to her, you should be outraged, right? There is no reason for this. And she sort of said, well, no, I, I can't think of a reason, can I? Um, there are other ways to do this. I mean, you could have a focus group. And if a student does say, well, yes, I do deal drugs in the you know, military science section, um, you can edit that out afterward. You don't have to like, go through all the consent forms beforehand. You can sort of fix some of these things after. Not everything has to be prior review. So um, it is a barrier. I mean, you, you mentioned not being able to study your own students. That's hard. What's more common is you can find out good things about your students, but you can't publish it. Because if you c it stays within the university, it's quality improvement. But if you tell someone at another university about it, well, that's research. And you didn't get the right permissions ahead of time, so you spike it. And so one of the things that happens is that a university that is doing great things with its students can't tell anyone. You know. Um, I'll also mention that there, there, in your story, there, there's some very simple fixes to this, right? For, for the yeah. bulk of these sorts, tell me if I'm wrong, the, yeah. for the bulk of these sorts of, of, of research projects, one could have a system where you don't get pre-approval, but you simply fill out a form saying, this is what I'm going to research. You file the form. If through a spot audit, some of those, some of that research turns out to have elements that are questionably, questionable ethically. There can be a, uh, a process to, to uh, uh, penalize or question that, um, and, and people will be on guard. They'll, they'll, they'll not want that to happen, um, but they, the, the system won't slow down or in any sort of significant way impede you know, the librarians from asking their students how, how they use the library. So uh, let me just say, you know, there were some comments posted on the article, and, and one of them was saying, well, what about these researchers who went out and lied to the people they were studying? And deception actually would be a potential red flag, right? You could, that would be part of a filter, where if you're going to lie to people about your project, and that's, in, in, you know, a central part of your research strategy, and it is for some valid research, then you get review. But I don't lie to the people I ask questions to. Dr. Sue didn't lie to the people she was talking to. Dr. Binder, I think, didn't lie. You know, she goes to the Harvard students and say, why did you interview for Goldman? That is a different kind of interaction than telling a restaurant owner falsely, I got food poisoning, how are you going to react about it? So yes, there are a lot of fixes. I'm not sure I would call them simple, because any system you can devise will have type 1 and type 2 errors. That is guaranteed. But we can do a lot better than we're doing now. Kevin, um, on the subject of, of, of regulation, there are regulations that we have on the books that need uh, tweaking, but there are also regulations we need to allow for more innovation. Um, you've got a story in the current issue of the magazine on, um, uh, on uh, boot camps. These are, well, I'll, I'll, if, if you don't mind just taking two minutes, summarize your story uh, about what boot camps are and why they're important and how they connect with, with with this issue of the nexus between undergrads and the workforce, and what regulations would allow them to, us to do more of them? Sure. Um, you know, the, the whole, the premise of talking about good colleges and bad colleges and, and regulating colleges and rating colleges is that um, to solve whatever public policy problems we want, 
we have a fixed universe of institutions to work with, and so we need to try to uh, influence them or push them or punish them to be better than they are in the way that we want to. Um, but that's, you know, from my perspective, a very limited way of thinking about what's possible. Um, and so the, uh, the article that I wrote was focused on a little more on the uh, immediate years after finishing your bachelor's degree part of the educational continuum and tells the story of a, um, uh, an organization called General Assembly, which is a for-profit, I'm not going to say college because they're not officially a college, they're a for-profit education organization that basically is in the business of, among other things, running um, what they call boot camp programs where you learn how to code, you learn how to do uh, user experience design, user interface design, um, a whole bunch of uh, skills that are very much for the economy we live in now. There are um, a lot of people out there trying to hire people who can code in Ruby on Rails, for example. It is, if you can do that well, you will find a job as long as you're, particularly if you're living in San Francisco or New York or Boston or one of the places where a lot of um, these new companies reside. Um, and the thing about these boot, camp, these boot camps, and there's one of them right here in Washington, D.C., about 10 blocks from here, um, is that they exist wholly outside of that system of existing colleges that we have today. Um, all of these questions um, that, are, that the federal government is posing are moot to them because they're not colleges. They don't take any financial aid. You can't pay with a Pell Grant. You can't pay um, with a student loan. This is actually people paying their own money out of their own pocket so they can learn something. Um, and that's it. So, you know, the, 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 the question that I sort of pose is, um, to what extent is this something that um, could start to be re a replacement for the uh, vastly growing professional master's degree industry that has essentially been created by existing colleges and universities as a way to make money. Um, you see a huge increase in the number of people getting master's degrees because once you're an accredited college, no one can sort of stop you from saying, oh, I have a master's degree program. And because of federal policy, there's actually no limit to how much money you can borrow to attend a master's degree program. So if you're an undergraduate, you can only borrow X amount of money and that's it to get a bachelor's degree. For a master's degree, it's whatever the college charges, plus your books, plus your rent, plus your cost of living, you can borrow a ton of money to go to these programs. Um, <clears throat> so all of which is to sort of say that as we think about this solution, I think it is a combination of working with the institutions we have, <clears throat> but also creating um, policies that allow for the creation of new institutions. Um, and, and it's been interesting to see, to kind of get back to your question, Paul, um, out in California, uh, the state regulatory agency that is in charge of looking after colleges started to notice a lot of these boot camps and started to say, well, hey, wait a minute, you look kind of like a college to me. You need to go and be my, you need to get my approval to be that college. And I think that's very much coming from, to a certain extent, the bureaucratic mindset that, as you say, exists for a reason, um, but can be very complicating when it comes to people doing new and interesting things. Well, um, with that, I want to open the, uh, to, to your questions, and um, we've got uh, some folks with microphones, um, and so raise your hand if you uh, want, you've got a question or, uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for the panel, and please, if you can, state your name and your affiliation. Any questions? We have a, we have a lady right here at the front row with a, with a question. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, I'm uh, the Peggy Ochowski. I'm the congressional correspondent for the Hispanic Outlook magazine. We focus on higher education. Uh, so, so I have a bunch of questions. Um, I don't know which one, but uh, have you have you done anything on on the um, uh, gender gap that more and more women are going into college now, and more and more boys are dropping out? So have you have you looked at that at all? Is there anything going? on in colleges that are encouraging women to stay and boys to drop out. And, and the same with like in engineering colleges uh, where you have more and more, um, there's more boys and girls, but most of them are foreign boys. What's happening to American boys uh, going into engineering? I mean, there's some department, especially in graduate school, so it's over 50% foreign students. Um, well, I, so I don't, that's I don't, a couple of things I wanted to ask. Well, thank you. I don't know that we've actually, I can speak to the, to the magazine, I don't think we've uh, focused as much on the gender issue. We did do a story in the last 
year's college guide about the growth of uh, uh, foreign students at American uh, schools, especially the flagships. Kevin, um, that was uh, uh, your story. Well, somebody else wrote it, but it was your data. You want to just speak to that a little bit? Um, sure. Yeah, I, I don't think that there's any question that um, there, there has been a large increase um, in the number of undergraduates. You know, this has traditionally been seen as a graduate student um, issue to the extent that you think it's an issue or not, but uh, for a long time, um, uh, a, you know, a very disproportionate share of uh, graduate students, particularly in the sciences, some of the hard sciences have been from outside the United States. And, you know, that's, you know, in, in many ways we see that as it's sort of our immigration policy by default, right, since we don't really have much of an immigration policy in the United States. Um, uh, what we've seen more recently is a growth in the undergraduate student population. I think it's, very, it's almost all coming from China. Um, so uh, as late as 2007, 2008, we had about the same number of uh, Chinese and Korean students um, coming every year, for example. I think we now have 10 times as many Chinese students. I mean, it's been that fast and that big an increase. Um, it's being driven, um, as near as I can tell, almost entirely by the financial interests of American colleges. Um, in other words, um, these are students who uh, receive no financial aid. They all pay full tuition. And the full pay undergraduate is the, uh, uh, the holy grail of enrollment managers in colleges across America right now. Uh, it's finding that student who will actually pay the sticker price. Um, there are, turns out there are a lot of people in China. Um, and many of them um, very much have a, a see American colleges and universities as um, high quality and, and prestigious, um, almost to a certain extent irrespective of where they are here in the United States. And so there's been an intense increase in recruitment and um, a lot of increase there. But, you know, the gender gap is an issue that's been with us for a long time. Um, um, women past men um, in their percentage of undergraduate enrollment, I think, in the late 1970s. Um, and so that's been, in, in, you know, by and large, I think it is more a story of female success than male failure. Um, you know, more, more men are graduating from college than used to also. It's just that women have increased their college going and graduating rates um, uh, even faster over time. And I think uh, for a lot of reasons that make sense given the opportunities or lack thereof in, in various employment fields. Um, but uh, uh, it's certainly at a campus by campus level. It's something that we see playing out a lot. And it is the case that um, not only are <coughs> women more likely to enroll in college, but they're less likely to drop out. Um, and I know, it, particularly on some campuses, that is something that they're, that they're aware of. Jamie? Yeah, just, to, just to add to uh, Kevin's uh, point there, you know, I think this is, a, this is an issue that's generally been poorly treated in the research. I think the trends that Kevin's talking about are very important for us to understand. But, you know, we're a national foundation. We get a fair number of over-the-transom proposals many of which aren't very well thought out in terms of how to address these issues because there's an assumption in the in the conversation and particularly in the policy debate that the gains made by women have come at the expense of men which is literally the a misspecification of what's going on here what's going on here is we've got to dramatically increase attainment and we've got to increase attainment for all groups and if you look at the challenges that women continue to face tony carnavali's research has pointed this out that women still essentially need a higher qualification to earn wages that are comparable to what men earn at the next lowest qualification. So in other words, as a woman, you still need one more degree than a man to earn the same amount of money, according to the Georgetown Center's research. Uh, that tells us something pretty profound about the fact that we should be focusing on increasing attainment for all groups, zeroing in on the challenges that men have had, so I'm certainly in favor of the, the focus particularly on men of color, in gaining access to and succeeding in college. But let's be clear here, we gotta talk about increasing attainment for men and women, and this zero-sum philosophy I think is worrisome, and I think is, is part of the, the challenge of, of us getting over those issues and recognizing that we have a macro problem, both with participation in higher education and success and entry into the workforce for, for men and women. Amy? Well, that was such a great point about women. I just wanted to go back to Kevin's point about um, universities chasing money. So in the University of California system, which clearly has a mission of educating Californians, um, Berkeley has a target of about 25% uh, out of state international students. Uh, UCLA is about 22%. UC San Diego is about 18% for undergrads. 
Right, that's a different subject, but really this is about um, this is about bringing in money, and it obviously has a, a lot of repercussions on the social mobility um, rates that we've obviously been very good at in the University of California system. So these are issues that are very serious. Great. Um, uh, back back there, there's a. Hi, good, hi, good morning. Thank you for this really great presentation. One of the things that, uh, I'm sorry, I'm Leticia Bustillos from National Council of La Raza, and uh, one of the things that never really gets spoken uh, about is the question of teaching. Teaching matters, and how a student is taught in the classroom has uh, tremendous implications for um, how they do in the classroom and how they succeed, but it's not something that is easily quantifiable. It doesn't appear in the rankings, and I would dare say that it doesn't factor prominently in tenure decisions about um, faculty. So I'm wondering if there's any, if you have any thoughts about how we can be more inclusive of the teaching process at the universities. Anyone? So this is actually something that, when I first start out to do this list, I wanted to try to get some indicators on this because the National Survey of Student Engagement actually does look at some of these things. It's not great and it's a little bit of proxy for some of them, but you can at least get some information on sort of how often students are intera interacting with professors and things on the actual educational experience they have in the classroom to try to acknowledge like those places that are doing that and sort of bump them up out of the list if they were doing it. And unfortunately, that data used to be public. I think USA Today used to host it. And nowadays, you actually can't, I couldn't find it sort of on a national um, set anywhere. And so I couldn't include it. So it was something that I thought is important. And it'd be nice to sort of see those data come back in a largely public manner. Uh, there ha I mean, the survey of student engagement is one. Um, one thing that we're doing, just anecdotally at Mason, is trying to increase the number of undergraduates who do an independent research project. Uh, this was a part of a long-term, you know, university-wide discussion about what would make Mason better, and that's what we came up with, and I think it's pretty good. It crosses all fields. It can be uh, artistic as well as scholarly, and uh, when you think about what it takes to end up with a senior thesis or a senior project, you start working on that your first year. So um, there probably are ways to measure this that would not be uh, as brutally simplistic as some of previous attempts. Um, this gentleman here had his hand up. Sorry to make you run down the aisle back and forth, but I want to be fair to both those close in and those further back. I'm Alan Sessoms. I'm a senior fellow at the American Association of State Colleges and Universities, and I run a couple of universities. But I'll comment just on one thing that Amy said. My daughter just graduated from Dartmouth with a bachelor's degree in physics. And there were recruiters all over the place from Goldman Sachs and Bain and others, but they were recruiting with a very large pool because you don't need to know very much <laughs> to go into that business. And if you're specifically in a technical discipline, there are very few. There were seven people graduating in physics uh, at Dartmouth last year. So it doesn't pay to recruit in that sense. But you get hundreds of kids who can be recruited because a, there's a lot of fish in that pond. I think that may be more telling than the fact that they have this tradition. Well, the recruiters actually say, we don't need you to have any experience in anything. Uh, we, just, we, just, we just want you because you're the best and the brightest. And that, I think, goes back to the point of, you know, we want you because you've come from Harvard or Stanford or Princeton or Yale or Dartmouth, period. You know, one of the interesting things we found in, in, in Kevin's piece is that um, a lot of, you know, a lot of employers um, are no longer doing the kind of, you know, junior management training or, 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 you know, give you a year to get your feet wet and learn on the job. It's too expensive. They can't count on uh, new employees sticking with them. They don't want to spend money to train somebody who's then going to go work for their competitors. So they want a kind of just-in-time skill set where that person can come in and start adding value from the moment they get there. Hence, the creation of these boot camps, which teach specific skills that provide value to the employer right off the bat. And this is almost unheard of in, in the undergraduate experience. It's just not what undergraduate uh, degrees are about, speci you know, job skills specific for, for specific industries. And, and that's part of the, so you have on the one hand, you know, the, 
Wall Street that will take, you know, the poetry major from Dartmouth um, just fine, that you'll, you'll, we can make you an analyst, son. Um, and you have the other employers that, um, despite, you know, a STEM degree, um, we're not going to hire you because you can't immediately start working. So it's, it's a weird uh, uh, broken nexus that we have. Um, this gentleman right here. I'm Claudio Sanchez with National Public Radio. Um, can someone up there talk about what the consequences of uh, should be for worse colleges, colleges that are just not doing a good job? Is it a regulatory thing that the government should have a role in? Is the market the place to kind of shame these schools into reform and to improvement? Great question. Well, I, I think it's pretty clear the market doesn't seem to do too well at this because you know, the, the schools are not going to go out there and put on their advertisements, we're not a good school, you should still come here. You know, you can walk around the town and, you know, if you get on the subway, you'll see plenty of ads for schools where if you were to go and look at their data, they're quite poor and they're never going to tell that to you. And so I think, I think the market mechanism to push students toward those colleges is always going to outweigh sort of their ability to sort of recognize the challenge. I think there are a number of things you probably could do on the sort of regulatory side from the federal government. Um, part of it is it could do a better job sort of making more data available so that people who work one-on-one -on -one with students could help get some of that information to them. But the other thing is I think it could start asking the question, you know, there is a requirement that every college who is in the federal financial aid programs has to demonstrate that they're administratively capable of being in them. And I think you really should start to ask the question if you're seeing a place that has an extremely low completion rate high rates of default on federal student loans, and they're making a large usage of those programs, to actually take a closer look and say, are they really administratively capable enough to hold on to these loans and allow them to stay in here? And then I think the other part is sort of asking about how do we actually change these institutions? You know, with the, the private ones, I think it's a little bit more of maybe there needs to be some more force that just says, you really can't make it in the market, and if you can't, that's unfortunate, but we need to find a way to wind you down. But for some of the public institutions where they really have a mission where they need to be serving people in a certain area and they're the only option, we probably need to ask some more questions about what can we do to encourage either changes in sort of administrative practices or sort of the leadership to get them to mimic some of the things we see the more successful colleges doing. Jamie, you uh, uh, hinted at some, th some broader thoughts about this. Yeah, and the you know, I th so here's, here's the issue, Claudia. I, th I think that um, w we've got to, the starting point's got to be that we have to raise our expectations of higher education to contribute to our uh, well-being as a society. And if we do that, there should be three responses uh, that, that are important. The first is the colleges and universities need to respond to that challenge. They need to up their game. And that's part of the, the conversation I think we're having now. The second is the market's got to apply more pressure than it's applying. To Ben's point, there isn't a whole lot of uh, market pressure right now. And I think that's a very important issue. And the third is there's got to be a different and be better regulatory frame, one that's focusing more on the results that the institutions are producing, particularly innovative steps that they might be taking to serve more students better. What's undergirding all of that, in my opinion, is part of why we're all here, which is more and better information. This is one of the critical things that I think the Monthly and New America Foundation are bringing to the table here, which is helping to better inform the conversation. The truth is, we can't answer a lot of these questions, like the question about teaching that was raised earlier, and that's not acceptable in 2014 given how important higher education is to our society. So I just think more and better information is really, really important and is something that the market should focus on, something that the institution should focus on, and something that the regulatory system's got to focus on. By the way, one more, since we were plugging books today, mine's not even done. Kevin's is done, but not, not yet out. Goldie Blumenstick has a new book out called American Higher Education in Crisis, right? And uh, which is a great primer on where we are in all of these conversations, and it's a great uh, I call it a higher education to English translation um, mm. <laughs> about what's happening right now in the space. And we need more of that kind of work, more of this uh, peeling back of the onion, a better understanding of what's going on, and then the application, to your point, Claudio, in the context of the institutions, how the market's using it, and being used smartly in the regulatory context. 
I'll, I'll take this uh, opportunity to plug my own book. Um, <laughs> Uh, we ac actually, I'm, I'm co-authoring a book. Uh, the Washington Monthly is publishing uh, with the New Press this this uh, spring, um, with the help of the Cresby Foundation. And what this is a book for the you know most of the college guides out there are for the families who uh, are trying to get their kids into the top 100, 200 colleges. This is maybe 10 percent of all students. This is a college guide for the other 90 percent. And we're hoping to inform the uh, students who are maybe first generation, uh, lower middle class, poor uh, students, maybe their families have never been to college. It, you know, I've, I've got a son who's about to go through this process and a daughter who just did. This is a daunting process to figure out what school to send your kid to. Um, as we heard today, it is a uh, much more consequential if you're if you come from a uh, if your high school is not preparing your students well if you're you know not a uh, a genius and you're going to be wind, wind up going to a second third tier state school or a private college um, where you could wind up with a whole lot of debt no degree and a and a and a world of hurt and this is a book that's going to I hope inform uh, if we can sell a lot of them, millions of students, um, about what their options are and how to, how to make it through the system. And again, to create the market mechanisms of self-interest and knowledge that right now just don't, uh, you know, don't exist in the, in the college field. So look for that. Um, my friend Amy. So Jamie talked about information. I mean, this question of what do we do with the, what do we do once we've identified the worst colleges? And there's been some talk about the information that we don't know, like we can't figure out learning. There's some, some of these pieces we don't know. There's some information, like labor market information, that we could know and could know pretty easily because we know how to measure that, for example. One of the other pieces that was in your, uh, in uh, this edition was about a uh, law that the federal government has put in place that would prevent us and us being students, their families, policymakers from knowing some very basic information like are students graduating? Are they transferring? Are they getting jobs? And I was wondering if you all, as we think about uh, your question, Mr. Sanchez, you know, what should we be doing? Um, well, we can't do anything if we don't know, you know, how bad things are, how good things are. So could somebody talk about that piece a little bit? Yeah, that's a great question, and it, and it sort of brings up a, a you know the politics of this rating system. Um, we it hasn't kicked in yet. I, my guess is we're not going to see the the this draft rating system until after the elections. Um, but we are going to see it. What's going to happen? Who who? What is the reception likely to be? Uh, uh, Jamie, you've been you've kept your eye on this uh, for a while. What do you think? Yeah, you know, I think that it's uh, the reaction is probably going to be predictable, which is what Amy's alluding to, which is the the laws that are preventing student level data, student unit record data, for example, as one of the the the, the key issues. Which I think there's going to be a pretty negative reaction uh, from a fairly large swath of higher education. But to Kevin's point earlier uh, in this uh, in this session, I think it's very important that we continue to pursue those types of transparency measures. My point is not in isolation. This is not solely the federal government's responsibility. It's a responsibility of the institutions and the market a as well. And I think that to the extent that the rating system can actually help improve uh, the public's understanding of what's happening and improve the responsiveness of the college and universities to do what I think they want to do, but they can't quite figure out some of the ways to get from here to there, uh, I think the rating system is going to be a good thing. But I think there will be a fairly large negative reaction to whatever it is that's produced. Uh, and uh, uh, just because of the, the, the nature of what we've seen in the last uh, 15 or so months since they've been, they've been talking about it. And uh, I think the real question will be, will there be actual legislation like there was with unit records a decade ago to actually prohibit a rating system? which I think would be unfortunate. I think that uh, the, the, the answer can't be, we need less information. That, that can't be the right answer. The, the answer has got to be, let's figure out a better, a different, uh, a, a, a deeper, more thoughtful way. But if the response is, let's get rid of this whole thing, I think we'll be taking a step back. Well, and, and, I, and to your point, Amy, I, I think it is the case that if we went, and please, I urge you all to read the story um, uh, uh, in the magazine about this, uh, th uh, having a student unit record system whereby the federal government can 
can link individual outcomes uh, at universities with their outcomes once they leave so that we can know which universities is give, are, are leading people to get jobs would actually be administratively easier for the colleges than what we have now. They could produce more information and yet have to fill out fewer forms. So the opposition to this that you're going to hear about, which is, oh, this is a, a burdensome new federal regulations, this actually would lighten the load uh, on universities and at the same time provide a wealth of new information for parents and teachers and all of us in order to evaluate our choices when picking a college. Some, some, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with a lightning round here. Uh, we're going to ask three questions, very short questions, and throw them up to the, to the panel, and then we're, we're going we're gonna to say goodbye. So this uh, lady right back here, very short question. Yes, uh, my name is Miriam Gusevich. I'm a professor at Catholic University. I'm one of the few people left who has the privilege of having tenure. And my question is, uh, are you at all addressing the other crisis, which is the fact that becoming a, a full, prof you know, a professor at the university at this point is becoming almost impossible. Most universities rely on adjunct faculty who are in many cases close to the property, to the poverty line after huge debts and you know how are you addressing that issue because that impacts the student okay we have a question, question about tenure next question well no just even becoming a full-time faculty a a absolutely Th this gentleman here uh, i'll make this really quick uh, naf is the cac i run a mooc platform in the middle east i'm a carnegie fellow here at uh, new america for six weeks uh, we've talked a lot about sort of consulting, finance, and having gone to uh, Yale for college, I understand the impact. What I'd like to hear more about is what about the rest of 95% of students that don't go to these schools? What are these colleges doing for their employment prospects? Have you guys considered, you know, okay, graduation is great, but if I graduate and I'm unemployed for a year, et cetera, the wage scar starts taking effect, et cetera. So what are colleges doing that works well in terms of employment and job to work transitions? Uh, what Kevin mentioned about uh, what Jake and Matt are doing at General Assembly is great, but for example, one thing they do that colleges don't do is they measure, one of their metrics for success is how many people get employed. So you did the boot camp on UX UI, they can say 80% got a job within X number of months. Great question, and uh, one final question from our friend Goldie here. I'm, try I'm trying to understand how do you reconcile this small but growing revolution in data analytics and learning analytics with some of the concerns that you've all been raising about how you can't measure what students are learning on campus, because it seems like these two are quite in conflict. Okay. Um, panel, lightning answers. Uh, I, I hate to argue against the idea that more information is better, but we've seen over and over that when you apply a metric, people game the system one way or another. That if you say you've got to get your students jobs, the easiest thing to do is to bring in recruiters who may not have the best jobs for the students. If you say we're going to measure ROTC and Peace Corps participation as one of the graphs do, you boost up the engineering schools because that's what the military and the Peace Corps want are engineering schools and schools that don't have big engineering programs fall to the bottom and maybe they say let's fire the history department and bring in more engineering. Um, and when you, you know, look at some of these effectiveness measures, if you look at student evaluations, then you bring in adjuncts who will do anything to get a top rating on the student evaluation, including lowering the challenges they put to the students. And there's some data on the inverse proportion of challenging courses to good evaluations you get from your students. So the fact is that data can be misused, have been misused, and I think we need to be a little more careful about applying these metrics. Yeah, I was uh, last week. I was on a, a, a different panel, and I was there with a gentleman from the um, uh, Texas system of technical training colleges, which has recently flipped over to a system of funding that's entirely based on employment outcomes. I mean, it's radical from a policy standpoint. You get 100% of the amount of money that go public money that goes to these public institutions is a function of essentially the difference between how much graduates are making in the labor market and the minimum wage. Um, the more they make, the more you get. Uh, now, um, obviously easier to do that with a system um, that is entirely focused on job training, and there is no research mission. And there frankly isn't a liberal arts mission that's kind of thrown in there either. It's, <clears throat> it's about getting a good job, the good life, 
that's for someone else to kind of worry about. Um, and you know, these questions came up about perverse incentives and this and that. But you know, his answer was he had two uh, plausible things that he said in response. One, he's like, look, we're an open access institution, so we can't actually start creaming off the best students to kind of come in here. And, and we should keep in mind that most colleges and universities are either open access or kind of open access, like minimal, every, you know, anyone above minimum standard gets in. And the second thing he said, he's like, look, <coughs> pardon me, um, imagine if we were switching back. Imagine if we had this system and someone said, <coughs> you know what we should do? Instead of paying for outcomes, we should just pay for enrollment and seat time and do it that way. He said everyone would be like, oh my gosh, imagine the perverse incentives that you're creating. They're just going to enroll anyone and just keep them in college or, you know, it's not going not to pay any attention to quality. They're not going to pay any attention to labor market outcomes. It's all just going to be about marketing and recruitment and making sure the freshman class is there and enrollment management. We can't have that. Let's not create incentives for that system. So all of which is to say there is no um, easy solution to this where um, we're not going to have to kind of guard against uh, how people are likely to react. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to optimize our incentives as best we can. You know, and I'll just add to that that the Washington <coughs> Monthly's basic college ranking system doesn't We'd love to have outcomes data on employment, and if we, if we get data that we, we think is reliable, we're going to add it. Um, but we don't just look at service. And in service, we don't just look at ROTC. We look at a whole variety of, of things because we don't think the college experience is just about employment. But we do look at other, every possible outcome we can, including graduation rates and loan default rates. And I think that if you've got a rich metric, um, sort of like the founding fathers created a system with uh, checks and balances, um, there's less likelihood, uh, there's less really capacity for universities to really improve their rankings by gaming one or two measures because there's, there's dozens of other measures there. And there, frankly, there, there are a dozen things we want from our colleges, not just one thing. Um, uh, folks, any other uh, answers to some of the other questions we got? I'm, I'm trying to remember the, the, the issue of <coughs> full-time full professors. The issue of uh, tenure. I mean, so it's, I think it's important to note that there are more tenured professors in America than there used to be. So we have, um, our, the number of tenure professors has not been increasing in proportion to either the population or the population of the growing proportion of students who go to college. What seems to have happened is that we had about a certain number of tenure professors in the 1970s. Over time, um, a larger percentage of college, of high school, more people graduated from high school, more high school graduates decided to go to college for a lot of reasons. Um, the nation got quite a bit bigger. We had a baby boom echo generation move through. So we all of a sudden had to educate a lot more students. And more or less all of the employment growth that happened to meet them was on the adjunct side. So tenure professors are shrinking as a percentage of all professors as you know, individual colleges make some um, economically rational choices about what they can buy in the labor market. That in the end kind of circles back around to the incentives that research institutions have to have doctoral students and, and to produce students, which don't really have a whole lot to do with the future economic well-being of the students and have a lot to do with what's good for the tenure professors who are already there. Um, so this is a lot of the sort of academy heal thyself to me. I mean, I think these are issues that kind of have to be resolved within the community of research universities and research professors. And, um, you know, what's good for some people is bad for a lot of other people, it seems. Well, I have a student who's actually working on a report card uh, rating the experiences of contingent faculty, so those faculty who are adjuncts uh, who may get paid $2,300 uh, for a course. If they teach 10 courses over the course of the year, they're making $23,000 a year. Um, and in any case, he's, he's creating this report card that, that shows that different institutions have different kinds of models for treating these contingent faculty, but that's probably the next um, kind of rankings that we'll right. be looking at. 2015, Washington. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, with that, I'm going to say uh, thank you to New America. Thank you uh, to Lumen Foundation for making uh, this uh, our higher education coverage possible. Thank you also to the Kresge Foundation, which has helped uh, publicize this and, and is uh, funding our book, and to the uh, folks at New America and the Washington Monthly who helped put this together. Uh, thank you very much. Really enjoyed having you all. Thank you. Thank you.